Welcome to Holding Light, Halcyon's first digital event and our first performance for 2020. I'm Jenny Duckchong, Halcyon's Artistic Director. In this performance, you will see five new works written for us earlier this year. Uh, four Australian works by composers Kate Reed, Andrew Schultz, Larry Sitsky and Gordon Kerry, and a newly reworked piece by British composer Nicola Lefanu, all for voice and cello. The project came about because cellist Jeff Gartner and I have been working together for many years. We first started performing together back in 2001 in Halcyon's first concert series. And um, since that time, we've performed many works and pieces together, including our first duo performance back in 2016 when we performed Of Earth and Stars. Holding Light is a celebration of this long relationship. And I wanted the composers particularly to focus on the voice and cello as equals, as co-collaborators, as we have been for so many years. And I think they all demonstrated their understanding of us as well as our instruments in these pieces. Um, I didn't stipulate a text for them. And in fact, I wanted them to find a text that really spoke to them. So they've drawn their text from very, very different and diverse sources. But there are still some particular threads that I think you'll discover during the performances. The pieces were completed earlier this year, but we went into uh, the church at Summer Hill and recorded them in July. And then last month, I spent some time talking to the composers and we've actually compiled those conversations into introductions to the pieces. So you'll hear the composers introducing their own works. So let's begin with the first two works on the program. Kate Reed's The Wagtail and Andrew Schultz's Flock of Angels. It's really nice to be here and to have a chat. So maybe you could just introduce yourself briefly and tell us a little bit about the piece. My name's Kate Reed. I uh, was thrilled to be invited to be part of this project. I really enjoy working with, as a composer with other people. I find that's the most exciting and meaningful way to be involved in music as a composer, which is otherwise a very solitary experience um, and rather dull at times. So it's, it, and it's so much fun working with you and Jeff and, uh, you know, just the sort of conversations we've had around music and it's been very inspiring and, and a great voice to write for. So that's terrific. Obviously we set the brief, it was a, a work for voice and cello. You already knew Jeff and I because we'd worked with you before. What, where did you go with that idea? What made you sort of create the piece you did? Well, I love poet, reading poetry uh, and I went to my, one of my favourites, Judith Wright, being you know, an Australian woman and someone whose poetry really speaks to me. Um, and she's got, uh, and then I just thought, well, she's got this whole section on birds and what a great, sort of idea to write a few songs about the birds that Judith Wright's been talking about. And then, then we just workshopped it and had fun with it. And It's really nice to have a, a piece that has lightness and humour and fun. And, you know, we don't have to take too seriously. It, it's serious music, but it's also, it doesn't take it, it's cheeky. The thing about this poem, and it's why I'm drawn to her poetry, is that the the words are so, they so evoke a sound and you really can create a sound, you can paint you paint the words, you know, with the music. And I mean, I just think that um, there is such, the, the fact that you and Jeff work so well, you can get these two different kind of sort of ideas going at the same time. One might be the bird or one might be the city lady thinking or whatever it is. And they, they kind of interact and overflow and they, it's, um, it's fun, it's like, it's like, um, it's like it's like acting. Why the wagtail and what did that particular poem and that bird, because he is so quirky, sort of create in your imaginings? It's interesting because all birds are quirky in their own way, you know. Uh, I mean, then they've all got, I hate to say it, it sounds like a bit silly thing to say, but they've all got their own particular personality, if you can use that for a bird. But the wagtail is so kind of neat and tiny and and organised and sort of together. And it was just something about it that made me want to set it to set it for the for the cello to have as much of a voice as as the voice to have in the in the thing too they are cheeky little birds and they've just got that they they've got that thing of saying you might think i'm small but i'm really big and i'm very important you know <laughs> Sweet, it flies. 
I'm Andrew Schultz, and uh, we're discussing the piece I've written for you, Jenny, which is called Flock of Angels, um, setting for voice and cello of a short section from The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. The piece is incredibly simple in one sense. It's, you know, it's beautifully still and quite meditative, and it feels almost like the phrases belong in slow, calm breaths. That's something I often try to do is how much can you take out of the structural out of the piece and for the, and for the building not to fall down you know what's the least you can have to keep the thing afloat and I mean that means it's um, as someone a conductor is doing on a piece that says this is naked music you know it's there's there's no uh, you know there's no hiding the tempo marking or the expression marking for the piece is still suspended and it's fairly moderate tempo and there's, there's rhythmically it's quite subdued although there's a um, very flexible sort of pulse in the piece with alternation of 4-4 four, four and 5-4 throughout so that you don't really get a strong sense of metrical pulse but it is kind of free floating. It doesn't feel like an oscillation probably to a listener but that movement between 4-4 four, four, four and 5-4 four means you don't have a, a sense of regularity you just have a sense of mm. unfolding which I think works mm. really really nicely with the text. I also, the way that the the cello starts sort of as a drone, but then you have these long notes sustaining in the voice as well when the cello mm. blooms. And we sort of, we, we, we interplay that together quite quite well. So you, you yeah. have moments of stillness and movement in both parts. Yeah, it's interweaving between the parts is what I was trying to do and to create movement and um, shape in it was actually about nuance and smaller things rather than um, relying on particularly large gestures, and I, I think that's also the nature of a, we could, it. Is, we, it is possible, of course, to write a very um, challenging, complex score for just the two two lines, but it is also, you know, tempting to just pair back to what is the least that you can do in a way. You know, actually, I guess that's in this piece certainly. I'd say that that's the case. I've tried to, to pair things back. Uh, but I think that's also about the text as well, that the text is actually, it's quite beautiful really, but it's also um, about irony in a sense that things are never what you think they are. And just when you think you've worked out what they are, they shift and they're not. So, and then a whole lot of practical things about writing for lower voice and uh, balance with cello, um, which uh, can easily overly dominate given you have a, a shared range, you know, so you have to handle carefully the interplay in that middle range where you, the voice and the cello overlap. Well, I think you've achieved that very well. Now, it's, it, was, it was a really, it's actually a piece that we really enjoyed rehearsing because of that kind of, it is, it's very much a dialogue where we had to respond, we even had to kind of hand the phrases to each other. The text is about beauty and um, it, that was what attracted me to the, the, the poetry uh, and it's about a series of paradoxes about beauty. There's something in um, Emerson of all people who had something very similar to say about beauty which is that beauty can never be grasped 
And I, I like that too, because I think that's part of what it means to be someone who's trying all the time to be creative in their work and find ways to express ideas and so forth, is that everything is perpetually slightly out of reach, that you'd never quite achieve what you'd hoped you'd get, and so you try again, you know? Well, two quite different works to begin the program. I'm, I love listening to the way that composers approach words and the way they set text. It's endlessly varied, as those two works show you. In fact, it's a conversation that I have had many times with many composers over the years because I love trying to understand what's in their brains, how they think, how they approach their music, why they approach their music, how they set text, what they think about words. And in fact, I was so curious, I began a video interview series a few years ago called In Conversation With. If you've enjoyed listening to the composers talking a little bit tonight about their works, perhaps you'd like to uh, take a look at the playlist that you'll find on the channel at another time. So let's continue uh, with the program. Next up, you'll hear Nicola Levenu introducing her three songs for Jane, and then Larry Sitsky talking about his two songs on a C pedal. Of all the composers on the program, everyone else is an Australian composer based here. You're our international guest for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We first met in Australia. Um, I remember meeting in the cafe of the bookshop uh, in Glebe, uh, because, as you know, I'm married to the Australian composer David Lundstein, and so I've been in Australia since 1976, and I love the country very much. And we used to come almost every year, but now being much older, unfortunately, the visits are very few and far between. This duo is three short songs set in Japanese texts uh, in English, 
And I love setting poetry in translation because when a poem is translated, it enters a new life. You, language captures a culture. When you go to another language, you've changed it completely. And of course, when you set a poem to music, you change it completely. And so I'm much happier setting poetry in translation than I would be, say, setting a Shakespeare sonnet or something which simply doesn't need music and which you can't allow, I feel, <laughs> to, to change into a, uh, a different medium. These are three very small poems with the wonderful vivid imagery that's typical of, I think, Japanese poetry. The first one is a little haiku. Um, the second one is, is a, a description, a beautiful evocation of a landscape, something else the vivid images of landscape are, are very beautiful in Japanese poetry. And the final one is a drinking song, which is about warding off old age. I wrote these songs as a birthday present for my cousin Jane Darwin when she turned 70. Um, and so a song that said, just have a drink of brandy, have a party and tell old age to go away. That seemed like a good idea. We've been having conversations for more than a decade, quite a long time now. Yeah. And yes. And, you know, we've only actually performed one of your pieces, but we've talked about many, many others before this one. So it's really <laughs> yes. to showcase this sort of new work for us tonight. That's right. Perhaps because we'd had conversations, it was a pleasure to then decide that I could arrange my soprano and viola work for mezzo and cello, which works just as well. It must be interesting to have conceived of it in one way and then to re recreate it in another way with another life. You know, what, what does that do for a piece for you? Well, the colour is altered in a very fascinating way. There's obviously the timbre of um, soprano viola as opposed to mezzo cello is remarkably different. Mm. In some ways, of course, the, the change is an easy one because with the viola and the cello having so much in common in terms of practicality, fingering and so on, bowing, all of that, that's a help. But the timbre is extraordinarily different. Yeah. Um, and so it was not a case of just making transpositions. It was often a case of thinking, this sounded in a certain way on viola, how shall I have it sounding on the cello? You've written a lot of vocal chamber music. I mean, that, that's sort of a very much distinct part of your work. So yes. this obviously draws you to that. So what is it about that form that you love so much? Partly because I love writing for voice. I always have. Um, I've written eight operas and probably some of my happiest times have been working in rehearsal on those operas. Um, and some have had a long run and many productions, and some have just been done, you know, one run, and that's the end. But it doesn't matter that it's, there's something wonderful about hearing and watching voices creating something. And then, quite apart from the opera, yes, there's vocal chamber music and vocal solo music, all of which reflects both my love of the voice because it's such a personal instrument, uh, and also because it takes us into poetry and it takes us into poetry in a very different way because when you read a poem you can take the whole thing in at once off the page but in music it's it's time I mean the a poem that takes one minute to read takes five minutes to listen to as a piece of music so you do go into the literature in a, in a different way. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted to join you and particularly to hear you singing the pieces.
it. Sitting in silence, patient and dutiful. It's not nearly as good as giving a party. Standing around, looking astute, sitting quietly, bothering nobody. It isn't much fun. My name is Larry Sitsky. I'm here to say a few words about a recent piece I wrote for voice and cello. When Jenny invited me to write a piece for her and cello, um, I have a big library here at home, just a few feet away from where we're sitting, in fact, and there's a huge amount of Australian poetry there. So for some reason, Brain kept saying Christopher Brennan, Christopher Brennan. So I went to that and I found a couple of songs I thought I can deal with this. And then because of the words and the slightly obsessive nature of the poetry, I decided I would write these two short songs with a constant C bass, the open low C on the cello. There always seems to be quite a dramatic contour to the works that I've experienced of yours. And so even in this very, very short piece, there's a sense of drama. And I think that the C pedal definitely adds to that. But how do you, what do you do when you kind of get a text like this? I sit and read the text over and over and wait for something to start up in my head. So I wait for the little alarm clock to go off mm. because then, by then, I've heard most of the song clearly enough. And then the writing, as you know, happens fairly quickly. Uh, it's because there's been this lead up thing. I wouldn't write the first bar of a piece if I didn't know how the last bar goes. No, it always impresses me how fast you can see, but that makes sense then, that it's already, once you actually set pen to paper, it is conceived in your head. It is. I also now have learned, um, I'm about to turn 86, so I sh should have done it by now. I, I now know what kind of texts work for me. Uh, and so whereas before I'd be floundering at that very first step, now I have a sense of security about the words. Um, I also, as a habit, and it's now become routine, before I start a piece, I tend to set myself an obstacle course. Sorry, if, if I don't set up the obstacle course, then uh, the music is simply in danger of picking up old tricks from past pieces. And I don't want to write the same piece again with different instruments. Once the start button has been pressed, uh, then purely musical considerations take over. In other words, I don't need the adrenaline kickstart thing anymore. I've done that. Yep. So then the rest is musical logic and what the voice does here, the cello will do this. It's all that stuff then. For me, even a little song 
it's theater already. Yes. You don't need fancy costumes and swords. And once you come out and start doing the thing, it's theater. Uh, so even a short poem is a operatic scene, if you like. I'd like to, at this point, thank all of the composers for their pieces. It's been wonderful 
to bring these new works to life and Jeff and I have really enjoyed creating the performances of these works written especially for us. It's more than a little bizarre to present world premieres via an online medium. To We miss that experience of being in the same space at the same time as that music comes to life together. But one of the advantages of having a digital presentation like this is that we can actually present these world premieres to a global audience. I'd also like to thank you for joining us for this presentation and I hope you've enjoyed discovering these works for the first time and I hope that you'll use this digital medium as an opportunity to go back and re-listen and rediscover these works. Um, it's a rare opportunity to hear a world premiere for more than the first performance and I'm quite excited that these works have this online life for you to share. I also hope that this performance is an encouragement and to, that long relationships, both with composers and with fellow performers to collaborate with, can produce wonderful things. I really hope that this in inspires you to seek out collaborators, whether they are composers or performers, and to form long and de long relationships and develop partnerships that will see you through several decades as well. So I'd like to leave you with our final work in the program, Gordon Carey's My Sorrow's Flower. Hi, I'm Gordon Carey and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about a piece I've written for Jenny and Jeff called My Sorrow's Flower. What I really like about the poet poetry is it's incredibly delicate. The words are so spare and yet there's, there's so much sort of depth of meaning which I really feel like you've brought out beautifully in this setting. It almost has little shainers in it. You know, it has these lovely individual sections that take you through the text that are quite different colour worlds and sound worlds and emotional worlds in some ways, even though there's an art that goes through it. There's so much content contained in, in, in a very small form. Which matches the poetry, I think, nicely, that, you know, that just because something is small in scale, it's not small in conception. And it's based on a poem from an American poet called Christian Wyman, whose work I came across a few years ago when he published a book in 2013 called My Bright Abyss. And it's a detailed story of how he was coming back to the Christian faith that he'd abandoned as a younger man, round about the same time as he was diagnosed with a particularly unpleasant and rare form of cancer. And over seven years, he charted his response to that emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically, and put it all together in this really rather stimulating meditation on all of that. I think the, the instrumentation worked very well with the text because the text is so, so refined and so concentrated and you know, gets such a lot of meaning out of so few words. And I thought that one could reflect that musically by you know, the very, very simple resources of a voice and a cello, which is effectively you know, a one-line instrument, though, of course, um, there are ways of... <laughs> faking polyphony and harmony and so on. And because I think the, the mezzo voice and the cello being sharing a lot of their compass um, means that you can create a kind of richness there out of less sound than you're actually producing. That to me reflected that, that you know, particularly that final image of you know, something like a, a dead or dormant tree that suddenly comes alive simply because it's covered in snow. Um, hmm. So the light changes, the shape of it changes, the presence of, of the thing changes. And I think that's a bit like what, what we're doing with the sound of, of the voice and the instrument. And it struck me that what he was doing there was elaborating an idea in the book, which is that, um, of course, life is never easy, life is never comfortable. And even being a person of faith doesn't necessarily give you a kind of security blanket against anxiety 
anxiety, fear, pain, and so on. But it is possible, he says, to find joy in sorrow, or at least uh, joy is always kind of underpinned by our experience of sorrow. So there he is looking at a tree in winter, assuming that it's the time of dormancy, the time of death, the time of negation, and sees this tree covered in snow and it's suddenly it's transfigured, it's beautiful, and that, that's a great moment of joy for him at the least expected moment. And I think that's something that, that's a universal kind of experience, I think, which is why I felt I would like to turn it into a song.
Well, that was the final work in the program. If you've enjoyed the performance and you'd like to know more about what Halcyon does, take a look at the website. Or if you want to hear more about events when they're about to happen, sign up to the E! News and you'll be the first to know about it and be like the supporters who got to hear this as a preview before this public release. Thanks.